Hi everyone, I'm Melissa Rosen. I'm also on the staff of the Jewish Women's Foundation of New York. Um, where did she leave off? We pride ourselves on supporting Jewels, Jewish entrepreneurial women executives and leaders. Members of our collective use their Jewish values and a gender lens to solve intractable problems facing women and girls around the world, in the Jewish community and beyond. These women are on the front lines of the COVID-19 crisis, supporting women impacted by poverty, sex trafficking, racism, and as Evie, our speaker today, will tell you, mass incarceration. Evie's organization, Witness to Mass Incarceration, sheds light on the injustices those identifying as women face in prison by documenting formerly incarcerated people's experiences and advocating for alternatives to mass incarceration. Before we begin, just a bit of Zoom housekeeping. Did Jenny come in? I'm just kidding. Um, we decided to hold this speaker series using the meeting format rather than the webinar format. To help you participate fully, please put your Zoom in speaker view by clicking the top right hand corner of your screen and selecting speaker view rather than gallery view. We also encourage you to use the chat feature to send messages to one another, share questions for our speaker, and any general comments. If you're on a computer, the chat icon is the speech bubble on the bottom of your screen. If you need help, please chat directly to any of the JWFNY staff who are all identified as host or co-host by selecting her name in the chat box. We've muted you all to avoid background noise, so the chat feature is the best way to make sure your message is seen. If you're inspired by what you hear this afternoon and want to support JWFNY, text JWFNY to 44321 to donate, and we'll put that info in the chat as well. Your generosity helps us support Jewish women leaders and creates a better future for women and girls. And now I'm proud to introduce the president of the Jewish Women's Foundation of New York, Rachel Weinstein. Thank you so much, Melissa, and thank you for jumping in there. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. This is uh, the first and what will be a series of monthly conversations with various uh, Jewish women social entrepreneurs that we support. So you will get an opportunity to hear more in depth about the work that they are doing. Um, and I'm thrilled that Evie could join us here today. Um, thank you, Evie, for your time. I'm gonna jump right in because we have a lot of ground to cover and I know you have so much to share. You know, obviously these are strange times with these shelter in place orders. People are feeling confined and trapped in their homes, you know, particularly those who are living in small apartments in New York City where this pandemic is at its worst. Um, they're missing physical contact with friends and family. They're missing the regular distractions and activities that they have in their normal lives. Um, and some people have said, you know, they even feel imprisoned. Um, or those living on their own say that they feel like they're in solitary confinement. What would you say to that? How would you make that comparison? Well, if they were on the street, I would stop them and talk them, to them immediately, of course, because um, they have their freedom. And, and if you're incarcerated, you don't. But more than that, um, being inconvenienced is a lot different than being incarcerated. You are inconvenienced in your life in that you're being asked to spend your days in your apartment in order to save your life. Um, you, are, you have the privilege of being able to go to your second house in the Hamptons or anywhere else. Um, with the exception of having to be limited in your space, you have television, you have computers, you have, um, you're not, you have food you can order for delivery. Uh, I actually, I, but what you don't have is being confined in a cell during an emergency. So if prison is bad and solitary is bad, prison during a pandemic is a nightmare because they basically, in order to handle any kind of emergency, everybody is locked down, which means you can't move out of your cell. So for people to understand the equivalent, the only equivalent would be if I locked you in your bathroom. And, and you could not get out of your bathroom um, and you would be served three meals a day in your bathroom and you had no phone, no computer, and nothing to do. Now, if you were willing to be locked in your bathroom for uh, 24 hours, 
then I would understand you saying, I feel like I'm in solitary confinement. But short of that, um, you are not, you are basically inconvenienced and you need to understand what a privilege it is you have to save your life. Yeah, totally. You know, t let's, let's, let's back up a little and, and, you know, we want to have this conversation with you. You're very generously sharing some from your personal experience and then telling us more about sort of co how COVID is, is impacting prisons now. You know, when you were in prison, how would you go about structuring your days? Because I think in the beginning of this, you know, people will about, I have this day and how would you go about structuring your day to help you move forward and pass the time and keep yourself you know, present and, um, you know, your emotional health? So first of all, you don't have your day. You can't structure your day. Your day is completely structured for you. Uh, it's frighteningly, frighteningly structured. So you are woken up at 6.30 in the morning. Your bed has to be made by 6.40. Um, there are scheduled activities like laundry. If you want, you have to bring your laundry three times a week. And if you don't get it there between 6.40 and 6.50, then your laundry doesn't get done. Then you have between 6.50 and 7 to eat your breakfast. And afterwards, you report to your uh, bunk, you get counted, and then you have to report to work. Your whole day is like that. The only time you have less structure would be after the evening count, which is at about 8.30. So between 8.30 and 11 o'clock, you can talk to people in your unit. But if you have a guard who is a very unhappy person, that guard will say, well, I don't like your attitude today, so everybody has to be in their bed and nobody can be talking. And that happens mm, one out of every two days. So how do you keep your sanity? For me, um, I, I literally started... Uh, uh, some of you know this about me. I did not uh, attend a synagogue and I was not involved with con congregations for uh, 40 years before I went to prison. And for me, the first day of prison, I started saying Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, and I said it all day. I said it quietly, but I said it all day. And that is that helped me. And I had to work very strongly at creating, at thinking about um, memories that were endearing or warm. And I had to spend every day in prison thinking about something that I enjoyed. And, and there's images of my father, images of my mother that I would replay over and over again in order to calm myself down. Um, most, when you're under it's amazing that every prison, people don't kill each other because the stress is so severe. Um, and I was in a camp. I was in what they called the most restrictive. My camp was called the cupcake camp. It's where Martha Stewart went to prison. And it's not a cupcake. It's in fact, because it is a camp, they make things worse. And they make things worse for women because women will not argue because they don't want to risk losing a visitation with their kid. So most, 70% of the women in prison have children and they won't argue. Whereas in a men's prison, they'll go on hunger strikes. They don't care. It's not the same issue. So in women's prison, there's no, uh, no one um, except for me tried to start a revolution. And once I tried, they watched me every minute. Tell so, us more about that. Tell us more about that. Okay, so if there are probably 20,000 rules, I'm not exaggerating, within a prison. So one of those rules are you can't congregate with more than three women because that would be considered inciting a riot. So if you went to eat lunch with three women, uh, an officer would come over and check you out. Now, I was writing... Uh, you're, when you come to prison, you're told right away, don't ask anybody their story. And I asked everybody their story, but people realized that I was an activist and I was sending out their stories through snail mail to be posted on the website. So people would seek me out to, to write their stories, to send it online. And I had guards following me everywhere. I um, was playing with fire 
for the entire time I was in prison. And part of me didn't care because I believed strongly that these stories needed to get out because I would say 80% of the women I was incarcerated with were guilty of nothing. And they were literally at the wrong place at the wrong time. Or it was a, such a stupid story that it's untenable. And if I might um, add something to just a thought, you have to understand that right now in prison, many prisons have 80% of the people testing positive for COVID literally 80%. Um, we, and I don't want to go off your questions, but the- I was going to talk about the COVID part in a minute. So can we, can we put that in the parking lot just for right. a few more minutes? Because okay. I definitely want to unpack that with you. Um, when we had our pre-call, you mentioned to me that you had been in solitary confinement in prison. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more about that experience? Sure. Well, First of all, the reason I went there is because I wrote an article about a woman who died. And I, I, in the article, I noted that um, had she been given a simple blood test, she would have been alive. So when, uh, as, when, I, when the article was posted an hour later, I was arrested, shackled, and thrown into solitary. Now, I'm older. I'm being shackled at age 64. And when you're shackled on your ankles, for anybody, even if you're not 64, it's a very painful experience and they know it. So they tried to make me walk fast and my ankles were bleeding going in. And then you're strip searched and they can choose, because I wrote an article that implicated an officer without naming him, they said to me, we can keep you for as long as we want. And they could have. Um, so the thing you have to understand about solitary is it's the single most fright. It's the single most frightening experience I've ever had in my life. Um, I became sick very quickly because the fluorescent lights, which are over your head, are on 24 are on most of the night, and they gave me a headache, and I developed vertigo, and I developed enormously high blood pressure. That I I knew it, and when they came to take it two weeks later, even though I begged them to take it because heart disease ran in my family. Um, when they finally came, it was 200 over 100. And I said, so are you going to take me out? And they said, well, we get $75,000 uh, if you die. So no, we're not taking you out. They don't care if you die. So you're with 60 other women in a, in a sound chamber-like environment. And please forgive me in advance for using a curse word. But, I, but basically all the women, and it's not simultaneously, it's 24 hours a day are screaming, get me the fuck out of here. And you're, until today, I hear those voices and I can't be in a loud space. Or if I am in a space that becomes loud, I have to leave it. Um, and you hear women committing, trying to commit suicide and you hear women who do. You hear them dying. For my part, because it was such a difficult experience, I really looked up at God and I said, I've had a great life and it would be really okay for me if I just didn't wake up tomorrow. So I, I was unwilling to, to commit suicide, but I really didn't want to wake up. Um, it's a torturous experience and I can tell you it's five years later and it's entirely changed me emotionally, mentally, and physically. There are things I cannot do. There are rooms that I'm in that trigger me in ways that I have to excuse myself. And it's very much narrowed uh, what I can do in life. For example, I can't go in, people, uh, I don't know what I can't do. So a friend invited me to go to a Broadway show and uh, I walked in and I was sitting in the middle uh, row and I couldn't bear it. I said to her, I don't feel good, I have to leave. And then I realized I have to sit always at the end row and near an exit door because um, I feel like I can't breathe. Uh, so it's, a very, it's, it, it's an experience nobody should go through. If you're in prison for any crime, there's no reason to torture you. This, was, this is an American made phenomenon. It sounds pretty, 
be awful. And uh, I'm sorry that it continues to, to haunt you in this way. And thank you for, for sharing it so personally. Um, a few people have just asked, just as a point of clarification, because you just mentioned that the prison would get $75,000 if you what? died. Well, he could have been making that up, but he implied it was a life insurance policy. And they actually are paid if, if, if you died. But, I, I, you know, this is, they could have been making that up. I don't know if that's true or that's just what he said to me to, because to be a jerk. Yeah, you know? I, yeah, yeah, I hear you. So tell me, you know, is there any place when you're in prison where you can take control? Well, there is only one place you can take control, which is religion. You can be any religion you want. You can change as often as you like. Um, so you'd have Jews, Christians, Catholics, Muslims, Wiccans. Um, the, you'd have sweat tank, sweat lodges for Native Americans. Um, and what's funny is, and I relayed this story to you, which I enjoy telling, is six weeks before Passover, um, people who self-identify before they, when they come into prison as Jewish get um, a piece of paper and you're allowed, it's a spe you're allowed to spend $300 to buy kosher for Passover food. So on that list is chocolate covered matzah, chocolate covered, you know, everything, nothing that you get on a prison compound. So uh, sitting next to me are about 20 women who are saying, look, I want in on that chocolate matzah stuff, you know, and roughly six weeks before you even get the list, 35 women convert to Judaism. So what we, we ended up having a Seder with a lot of women, most of whom are not Jewish. My friend Marika and I were the only ones who knew the service in Hebrew. And uh, they permitted us to have um, a whole day to set this up. It's all paper cups, paper plates, but, and you get, two nights for five hours a night where you're allowed to have the service and there's no guards there. So people do it for the food. They also do it to get five hours each night out of a horrible environment. So Marika looked at me and said, um, why don't you do the Shema? I mean, why don't you do the Manashtana? And I said, okay. And I sang Manashtana, Halayla Hazeh. And at the end, the entire room of people clapped. And I looked at her and I said, they think this is like a Broadway show. They don't understand this is like a service. But anyway, people love the food. They come over to us and ask us, what is, the, what is stuffed cabbage? Why do we eat matzah? But at the end, uh, at the end of the holiday, uh, everybody converts to Muslim because Ramadan is up next. So people can keep switching around depending on which gets what, and they can't, the guards can't do anything. So it's the only area where we get a little bit of joy. Well, I'm glad that's there. I'm glad that's there. Um, some of our, our listeners might not know, but you are the child of Holocaust survivors. And so I imagine this idea of confinement informed your whole life before, you know, it was being carried over um, from your parents and informing then how they maneuvered in the world after they had come through the Holocaust. How, how, how was their confinement? How did it impact you in your life from the very beginning? So let me say this, that I come from uh, a set of, my parents were in Jewish DP camps um, where they met and married, as did a hundred other couples that when they came to America, the, we were all together. So uh, the Holocaust was, did not end in May 1945. It was a fluid living experience that was with us every day. So typically on Shabbat, uh, we all ate dinner together. Afterwards, my father, I would ask, I was interested and they were willing to talk about it. My parents answered any question I wanted. So there's two components to this. I wanted to know of my mother's uh, 70 people that she lost, who were my aunts and uncles, who, were ev who was everybody. Um, so I wanted to know about their lives. Mm -hmm. And I also lived, you know, I'm from, I went to the Catskills every summer and we had half the bungalow colony. <laughs> and 
the other half that were American people would wonder whose kid belonged to who, because we were literally a meshed family. So my experience as a child growing up was extremely positive and very open, uh, which not all people had. In terms, and my parents um, made a point of starting to speak publicly at a very young age about their experience. So they would speak in, the only, they only didn't speak to kids under 12, basically. Uh, but they spoke in high schools, junior high schools, colleges uh, for like 20 years. So it lived with me in a way that any, there would be times when I'd hear them talking to a crowd and I'd hear a story that I hadn't heard before. But it was, uh, in fact, one of the most important stories, if you want me to tell the story, the most significant story which impacted me in prison was a story I didn't hear till like 1988, for 45 years after their uh, liberation. Um, you, do you want me to share the story? Sure. Okay, so by 1988, most of the Holocaust survivors had that we knew and grew up with were doing well enough to buy an extra apartment in like Boca Raton and go there for the winter. And I knew my parents wouldn't do that, so I bought them an apartment. And we went together for this one New Year's Eve. And while I was there, while I, was there I heard the story. Uh, my father told me that if in about 1940, my father was, it, my father had been in 12 labor and concentration camps. So on, and Jews weren't allowed to carry their Talis Tefillin or their prayer book. And um, one day he decided to carry his. And of course, a Nazi on a horseback stopped him and called over some other Jews. And he beat my father to within an inch of his life. And he wanted other people to see that. And after he left, um, someone slightly older than him who was a Jewish doctor worked on him and said, I've done all I can, the rest is up to God. And my father looked up at God, which is why I think I looked up at God in prison and uh, said, if you spare my life, I'll honor you every day. And so I grew up watching my father with great joy, Davin, every day. And I remember, I would always sneak into the room and whenever he was putting on the straps, I would stick out my hand so he would attach us. I loved it. And in fact, it's that image that kept me alive in prison. It's that image that was crucial to my survival, his joy, his finding a little space in a room. What I didn't know is that uh, during this weekend when we were down in Florida, my parents went to an event with other survivors, about 200 other survivors. So there's two rooms of survivors. And a woman walked over to the, my parents' table and introduced herself as Mrs. Schindel and said, my husband, Dr. Schindel, is in the other room. And about five minutes later, there's crying and screaming and nobody knows what's going on. And everybody goes to the other room where my mother sees my father on his knees with his arms wrapped around a clearly partially paralyzed man. And this man was the Jewish doctor who 45 years earlier, it's hard for me to say this, had said to my father, I've done all I can, the rest is in God's hands. And that's so beautiful. That's me. That's so beautiful. Yeah, that's one oh. of the most important stories in yeah. my life. Um, Evie, you notice I didn't ask you, we talked a little bit about this when you and I talked last week, and th there have been some questions about it, but I didn't kick off this conversation by asking you about why you'd been incarcerated. Can you talk a little bit about why um, that's, you kind of educated me on why that question really um, isn't appropriate? So I think the person who actually answers this the best is Brian Stevenson. Um, and he says it often, and he says, each of us is more than the thing we've done. And I think that's important to, uh, to hear. And I, he also says, if you, you know, if a person tells a lie, they're not just a liar. If a person steals something, they're not just a thief. And if a person kills someone, they're not just a killer. Um, the reason that I, I, I encourage people not to do it is similar, that 
then that person becomes something in your mind that, oh, that's the one who robbed the bank. But the other reason, which I think is more important, is that there's a distinction that is a terrible distinction that's made between nonviolent, low-level crimes and violent crimes. And that's a binary that shouldn't exist. The reason is that most people who are, I have to stand, when, when we pass laws, they should be for everybody in prison, not just the low hanging fruit as people would like. If someone's in prison at age 55 and they committed a murder when they were 17, they're just not the same person. And for you to hold them accountable as a violent offender who used a gun is to mischaracterize the fact that they've spent 30 years being institutionalized and they did something when they were young and probably regretted it. And I think it's very important for us to support people with violent ba uh, criminal backgrounds. The other reason is most women who have violence, um, it's usually connected to a drug charge. So let's say you are in a car with your boyfriend and you're stopped and there's drugs in the car. The police, then there's no gun. What the police do fairly regularly is they look at everything at other cars and in your house. And if there's a gun anywhere, they add a gun charge and that turns it into a violent charge. So even if you're arrested for having a personal amount of drugs on you, if there's a gun anywhere that adds seven years and it basically destroys your life because you're now labeled as a violent criminal. So if we were to redefine crime or recharacterize everybody who was in prison, you would understand that most people who are in there for violent crime are people of color who committed crimes when they were 17 and our brains are not formed as everybody knows until you're 25 and uh, we hold them accountable for being violent criminals. So we need to stand behind this and people need to understand that there's a big difference between a kid who kills somebody and a serial killer or a serial rapist. There's a huge difference. And out of the 2.3 million people in prison, probably only less than 5% really need to be uh, put someplace. And it doesn't have to be in a prison cell. It, you can have a mattress if you're being put away for life. You can have a room of your own. You're not going anywhere. And it can actually have a mattress that's more than a quarter of an inch, and it can have a TV. We should treat people the way we would want to be treated, even if they're a serial killer, because clearly they're mentally ill. Thank you, Avi, thank you. I'm gonna switch gears a little because I wanna make sure we have time to even to cover questions. You know, we, you shared with me some staggering statistics last week about how COVID is impacting prisons, and maybe you can share a bit of that um, now with everyone. Okay, um, let's distinguish between what's going on in prison and understanding that some people are being released out of prison without being tested. So let's not forget to go there. We'll do that. So, uh, for example, 40% of the people that are incarcerated of the 2.3 million people are elderly or have low level crimes or um, or have less than 90 days to complete their sentence. That's 40% of, that's 800,000 people, something like that, or more. No, I'm sorry, that's not a, yeah, 40% of the people. There's no reason not to release people. There is uh, no, there is, there is almost zero recidivism for elderly people. Anybody released over a certain age just doesn't go back to prison. Um, Governor De DeWine of Ohio was asked to reduce his population by for those 40%. And that number was about 20,000. And the names were given of the elderly, of the people who were immunochallenged, of people who had diseases. He let out seven people. And what I will tell you now is it is outrageous around nursing homes and it's outrageous that there's not a count of how many people are dying in prison every day. There's not a newspaper, there's not a stream reporting it, but I fear that hundreds of thousands will die because people, people have yet to make this a priority and to say we have to end this practice of mass incarceration. 
So I fear we're going to see a half a million people die from this inside prison. And when I say that number, people just go, really? I said, if you have 80% of Ohio uh, prisons showing positive, and at Bedford in New York State, you have 500 cases of COVID, you have to understand that there's no social distancing, there's no soap, there's no disinfectant. In fact, we make disinfectant for you and we get none of it. And it's kind of like when my mother was making warm hat, mit, uh, wool hats and mittens for the Nazis, but never got to wear a pair. We're doing the same thing the Nazis did. Um, we have to care about this population because they are us. I am you. And you mentioned as far as testing that it was only the staff who was being the tested. Is that correct? Um, well, Governor Cuomo just ordered that uh, because they're, they're considered first responders, they'd be tested, but I don't believe they're even being tested in other states. No, I, I can't imagine Mississippi or Alabama or Texas are testing anybody. So not only, they are, by not dealing with the prison system and, the, and what's going on, we are exposing ourselves to potential long illness because two things, they come home, they, their families go out, and what scares me more is the, um, there's no, because prisons don't release the name of people who come out for so-called security reasons, we don't know, who, the population doesn't know who's coming out. So formerly incarcerated led organizations like mine are talking to people inside prisons and getting the names of the people that are coming out because they're not being tested, they're not being quarantined, they've been exposed, for their own sake and the sake of everybody else, uh, we have to help them. And uh, I mean, I just got one COVID grant to give 100 women 100 uh, food cards. And what's $100 gonna last, a week or two? You know, but we need more of that. Um, they're not Thank getting- you. Let me go a little bit. You know, tell us a little bit about what you're doing with the formerly incarcerated when people are coming out. Um, you know, both are in general, as your organization does, and specifically now during this pandemic. So during this pandemic, let me start with that because it's very, you know, if you're, there's no SNAP office open, there's no HR, you come out of prison and you have to sign up for benefits. You can't sign up for benefits. You can't get that SNAP card. You can't, most importantly, you can't get a job. 30 million people are unemployed you're on the end of that line. You're, there's not even a possibility. So I came out of prison with nothing. I walked out, you know, with nothing. I didn't have $3. And also what you have to understand is I don't, I like many people who are below the 40% earning mark, I don't have a savings account. So I'm a formerly incarcerated person and if I didn't have a tiny bit of grant funding, I'd be on the streets tomorrow. I have no savings then. I have a little bit of got Baruch Hashem of funding from foundations, but most people have, do not. So they're living, um, they don't know what to do. They don't know where to get food. They can't travel around the city, but uh, financial insecurity, food insecurity, is tragic for this population, both those that are newly released and those that have been out. And also they've all lost their jobs because we don't, we can't get employment. Understand our employment rate is 27% and black women are at 43% unemployed. So now that 30 million people are unemployed, the rate of black women will probably go to 80% unemployed. What are we gonna do? How are we supposed to live? Unless we as a Jewish community and as a world community take care of those that have less in a very intentional and structured way, not one check at a time, but in a thoughtful way, um, then I think we have a problem. So what I'm doing is a couple of weeks ago, I realized that there would be a new industry of testing and contact tracing and uh, about a week after I thought about the fact that this is a new industry, 
I, I wanted to immediately figure out how to get jobs for formerly incarcerated people. And I noticed the Rockefeller Foundation was talking about funding close to 300,000 jobs and Bloomberg Foundation talked about between six and 14,000. So basically I spoke to people I know and I said, look, all of you talk about economic inequalities and all the inequities that exist. So this is a once in a generation chance for you to do the right thing by carving out 20% of those of that industry, that new industry, to not just formerly incarcerated people, but people who have not had a chance to be lifted up of poverty. And I need all the support I can get for this venture because I think this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to employ people in jobs that are not part-time, but that give them a chance at success. You give people that chance, they will succeed. So anybody who wants to help, let me know. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be sure to give their details. Um, I had one question come to us from um, one of our uh, guests today, you know, about what changes have you seen since you've started your organization and what impacts have you seen? You know, what, are there some anecdotal or some tangible things that you can tell us about? In terms of what though? In terms of, of, of how you may have impacted the system to change it for the better or, um, you know, certainly with people coming out, formerly okay. incarcerated people, I know you have. So there are traditional large nonprofits serving formerly incarcerated people. And when I came out, I went through most of them. I did not, uh, what I needed was housing, employment, uh, medical and mental health, and community support. I found the community support in the Jewish community. But I had to, I sought that out and not everybody knows to seek that out and not everybody is comfortable. Um, but having gone through all these large organizations that collectively get a hundred million dollars just in New York City alone, they were useless. They were transactional in nature. One, met, one uh, resume, one meal, one employment training and couple of job interviews and then they're done. And the other piece is transitional housing. So going from prison where you live with 150 women to going to a shelter or a facility where you're living still with 20 women and under rules is going from a prison to a prison. So I was probably one of thousands of formerly incarcerated people that said this will not do and being a baby of the women's movement i formed witness i said this will not do we need to ask for what we need we need people to go direct to us because we know what is needed so there is a network i formed a coalition in new york city of formerly incarcerated led organizations these are organizations that have one or two people that are doing the best work on the ground that know everybody that's coming out. But more importantly, I'm part of three national networks uh, where we really, through our listserv, on a daily basis, we know every prison in the United States where there's a problem. We, because we, can get, we get emails from inside or phone calls from inside, and we're handling it one at a time. We are pushing up against uh, everybody to say you have to do more. And so I would say support the local on the ground organizations that do this work. And, and uh, I'd say within a few years, we will be making a major impact on re-entry, on employment. I'm currently talking to two or three people about getting a building in Brooklyn with 85 apartments that'll be dedicated to formerly incarcerated people as they come out and so that they don't have to, I was homeless for 16 months. I assure you with my background, there was no way you could have told me I would be in a woman's shelter in a terrible neighborhood at risk all the time for my life from the people I was living with. Um, what I went through is not something I ever thought I would go through and nobody should go through that. It's, you have to, if you do go through that, then it brings you, it, it, then it gives you character like all these women who survive and thrive are people you wanna hire. Just like my parents who came through the Holocaust 
and they had a smile on their face. You know, the biggest thing people ask me is, why do you smile when you went through such hell? And I think that's a strange question. I'm so glad to be alive. And I'm so excited about every hour that I get to do the work I do. Evie, thank you so much. I think, I mean, I think that's a perfect place to, to stop. We, um, we so appreciate you sharing your story with us today. We so appreciate the work that you're doing. You know, you're channeling your own personal experience. You've lived it, you've breathed it. It's clear that in some ways it still haunts you and you are, you are making good from it. Um, and so thank you. We're thrilled and honored to support you. And we're very inspired by everything that you're doing. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Jane. If, if I may thank the Jewish Women's Foundation of New York for choosing to support Witness to Mass Incarceration. Uh, you have done, you uplifted me in a way that changed my life. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Evie. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Amazing conversation. I learned so much from Evie. I learned so much from all of the chatting in the uh, chat box. Uh, really very enlightening. Thank you for, to everyone for joining us today. Uh, someone asked me to do a shout out to the men who are on the call because we need allies. We need male feminists. We really appreciate having you here as well as the incredible women who are on the call. We believe in ending these sessions with a specific call to action or for. So the first thing is that tomorrow you'll receive a list of petitions from Humane Outbreak Response that you can sign. The second is you'll also receive a video promoting the census called I Count, and we hope you'll share that on your social media. Third, follow JWFNY and Witness to Mar Mass Incarceration on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and on our websites for more information about the work. And fourth, you can make donations to Witness to Mass Incarceration by visiting their website. We posted that link in the chat, and you can reach out to Evie directly and ask her what she needs and how you can be with her on the ground working on these issues. We look forward to seeing you as we spotlight our jewels the first Thursday of every month at 4 p.m. And on June 4th, we'll, heal, we'll speak with Yavila McCoy, who is the CEO of Dimensions Inc., about her work supporting Jewish women of color and how the pandemic has necessarily altered that work as the rate of black and brown people dying from COVID soars chills. Again, on behalf of all of us at the Jewish Women's Foundation of New York, thank you for being here. Stay safe and stay sane. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Oh, oh. Allie says bye. Bye, Allie. That's Allie, everyone. My significant other. <laughs>